thank you so much, Petra. I think a little bit of hammering always adds to the atmosphere. It inevitably happens when you have a conference. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I want to thank the Institute for Art History and the very new but extremely busy Center for Photographic Studies uh, with, within it, and also the Czech Academy of Sciences. And mostly I want to thank the organizers of this conference, um, Hannah and Fedora and Petra and Barbara, who have all done a huge amount of work to get it ready and to get us um, online and going. I hope that you can all see me and I'm going to share my screen. Petra, you'll let me know when it's being shared, I hope. I hope you can all see my screen now. All good, you're nodding. So I'm gonna take that as a good sign. Today, I want to talk to you about photographs and the scientific notebook. Um, and the way in which photography insinuated itself into the working practice of scientists, because I think it's important that we take it materials very seriously or the consequences of photographic materials in general, as Rainy Dustin uh, exhorts us to do, and of photographic materials in particular. Um, to do this, I want to step back from those kinds of images we normally look at, those things that come out at the end in the published practices, very often those iconic photographs that Peter Gallison speaks of that are made to be front and center of an entire working group of um, uh, images and use Omar Nassim's notion of the working images behind that, the pre-publication images. Those pre-publication images, we got a chance to see some of them last night, actually. Um, everyone was very familiar with the published image of the black hole. Uh, from the Event Horizon Telescope, but it was most interesting to look at the decisions made in the pre-publication images, those ones that were monochromatic, the ones that were a bit more defined, the ones that were a bit more diffuse. It's those kinds of images that don't make it to publication that are the ones that I'd like to take today. These are sketches that need interpretation. They need, in, they need training to read. Um, they're ones that are used to learn things by or to make decisions over, as we heard uh, last night. And I want to do this because I think it's important. There's something important in looking at the working images of photography and to understand how photographic practice brought to by scientists to their working notebooks not to the illustration phase, but to the working part of the research um, when photography was moved into scientific note taking. And I do lean fairly heavily on uh, several scholars. Oh, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. What I should say actually about these images first is that these pre-publication images, unfortunately, um, you have to find them first. They're not so easy to find. If published science photographs, uh, the iconic ones are brown specky things as John Darius once called them uh, and thrown away in droves. Well, the working photographs, uh, the ones that don't make it into print have suffered even more. In part, this is because they fit only awkwardly into note taking and which was already a highly developed practice when photography came along and sketches were much easier to put in a notebook. So materially it fits. For that reason, I'm gonna take a broad definition of a notebook and let's call it the expanded notebook, for instance, because the material photographs cause the expansion of notebooks in part by their physical attributes, but also because of the way they could be repurposed. And in doing this, I've leaned heavily on Omar Nassim's notion of the uh, working, working images, that is working photographs, who I, and I've just mentioned that. Jennifer Tucker's really excellent insights about how collections of disparate photographs can be brought together as evidence, not to mention her 
many writings about photography and community practice communities being in the in sciences in law or as i suspect she'll talk about later today in another fascinating installment in industry and to anka tehazen for her thought-provoking writing about expanded places and spaces of learning in sciences as they occur in both scrapbooks but also in cabinets of science so around the scientific lab laboratory because i have only 30 minutes I've broken the talk into three rough sketches just to make it a little bit easier to follow. Um, it's early in the morning, sometimes very early for some of you. Um, and I want to talk very briefly about each one of them, photographs in the expanded notebook, the notebook and the photographic catalog and experiments and note taking. Given the disruption to all of our archival work in the last months, I want to ask you to just excuse some of my illustrations, which were made ironically as part of my own note taking and are highly imperfect in, in many ways. But I also wanna take the opportunity to especially thank Melissa Mead of the University of Rochester Special Collections, who heroically delved into Fairchild's archive to produce a, whole, a number of crucial scans that we didn't have of both the notebooks and the images from a really extensive collection, which was not scanned. I want to say thank you to her for doing that, even when the public wasn't allowed in. Onwards, photographs in the expanded notebook. To start with the expanded notebook or the concept of it, um, I, I want to start with Sir William Crookes because part of the problem of finding photographs that didn't make it into print is that they're often separated from the notebooks in which they play a critical part. Crookes's notebooks are a great example. Uh, you might know Crookes for his invention of the Crookes tube in 1875. You might know Crookes for his discovery of thallium in 1861 or possibly for his most lucrative activities, because we all know how poor the pay is as a private scientist, as the president of the Society for Psychical Research as a champion of spiritualism, which is what made him most of his money. Um, many people don't know that he was also deeply involved in photography from the very beginnings of photography. He was a close friend of Henry Talbot's, and he was for a long time the editor of the Photographic News. He also made photographs and very famous uh, stereo photographs of the moon. These are from a collection from the V&A's collection. But he has a number of notebooks. Now, half of his notebooks are in the Royal Institution, and I want to thank the Royal Institution for access to these. The other half are in the Science Museum. Uh, unfortunately, they're in the radioactive store, and they're not due to be released for another eight years, I think it is. So I can only give you half of the installment of Crooks's notebooks. And in another eight years, we can all get together again and I can perhaps give you the other half with a little bit more enlightenment. So this page, here's a notebook page. It's 20th of May, um, 1908. Like many of the pages of several volumes of this notebook is all about photography, but it doesn't have any photographs in it, which is very, very common. It's very representative of Crookes's notebooks, but it's also very representative of many of the scientific notebooks that I've seen. Um, uh, Bentley's notebooks, the famous photographer of snowflakes, have no images in them. They are just notations and the images are elsewhere. Um, it's very common to have the photographs in another space because it's very difficult to get the materials together. This explanation of Crookes's page is a very typical photographic experiment. Um, and you can see it drawn in the middle there. It's a flat plate. One takes an object and puts it on top of the plate and puts some sort of, um, uh, and, and receives some sort of image from it. Of course, Talbot made these kinds of images. We often call them photograms now. Um, these particular experiments were made by Crookes to prove that the, these rare earths, as he called them, in this case, pitch blend, which is the material, uh, of course, from which uh, radium were, was distilled, 
and polonium, I think. From these emanations, Crookes wanted to understand that the photographic plate was sensitive to things that were not just sunlight. So you see he has a piece of paper in between his mineral and the photographic plate. What's interesting is that this page represents actually two photographic photographs made. The one which is the drawing of the experiment in which there was a block of pitch blend flattened and some powder and they were placed on a plate. The bottom drawing is a drawing of another photograph in which there were uh, seven pieces of something put on a plate and those numbers are there to represent uh, whatever it was that was put on the plate. Um, so these are in some ways quite representative of, of, um, of Crookes's work, but also quite representative of the kind of materials that were involved in making these experiments. They show half photographic practice, that is the makeup of a photographic experiment and what one needs to do um, in order to make it uh, into a photograph that will do something. But they also show his method of using photography in his observations about rare earths. I've uh, transcribed a little bit of this in part because I wanted to whet Jennifer Tucker's appetite by saying that they were from the National Mineral Corporation Limited. And in the other, because as I was reading it, he describes that one of the blocks was flattened on one side and laid on a film. And then I thought to myself, do you know, that sounds really familiar. In fact, it is. It, there is a piece of pitch blend that we know is Crooks's um, that is in the Science Museum and is now in the radioactive store. As you can see, it has been flattened on one side so that it can lay flat on the photographic material. This is just part of organizing the experiment so that photography can take it. Photographic plates or, or films are a flat plane. And if you're going to make an impression on them, the surface that meets them really has to be flat and directly against the surface, the sensitive surface. And this is the image that was made from that particular uh, rock. We know that because we found them together in the Science Museum before they were shipped off to the radioactive store. And I have published on this before, but reading the notebooks was a revelation uh, because I realized that he's still using this piece of pitch blend. Uh, this particular image was already published by the time he wrote his notebook page in 1900, or at least read before the uh, Royal Society. So there's two things to notice about the expanded notebook of photography. The first and the most basic is that notebooks are separated from the photographs. These two things are washing around in the Science Museum collection, these two objects. The notebooks have been moved to the Royal Institution because they are paper and they are notes. And they come in all shapes and sizes and sorts of materials. Uh, photographs can be paper, they can be plastic, they can be uh, glass, they can be negative or positive. They might be small, they might be large, they can exist in a series or be single exposures or moving images. They don't always lend themselves to the kind of notation that a notebook has. The manufacturing of standard notebooks uh, by that are used by scientists rarely match the manufacturing sizes of photographic materials. They require different systems, even within one photographer's practice. Second thing to note, is the frequent repetition of some of the photographic methods. Um, and I want to talk about two things that Crookes notes. One has to do with his first observation, which is that if you create photographs that have to be housed somewhere else, and, and Crookes notes this, that it's very inconvenient to have a running set of numbers. If you use the same numbers for the chemistry and the photographs, as he says, it will cause gaps in the negative albums. Even reading this pains me because we don't have any negative albums for Crooks, but apparently there were some somewhere. Perhaps in eight years, we will discover them in the Science Museum huddled away in the corner. Um, so he, Crooks developed a system for numbering his pictures only and a system for numbering his experiments. This is very common. Um, one sees it in Herschel's notebooks, one sees it in other notebooks. And I can talk, I'll talk about that when I get to the notion of cataloging and how cataloging comes into the notebook. But as you can see, Crookes already considers his running number for the negatives to be part of his running number 
for chemical experiments. That is, they come from the same place and they be, can be considered to be part of the same scientific activity of noting things down. I just want to talk for a moment about photographic materials and crooks and many people, in fact. Um, the repetition of these kinds of experiments is very common. You often find very, very similar types of photographs. And they are, as we saw yesterday with the event horizon photographs of the telescope, attempts at resolution of a particular sort. Now, it's interesting that one thinks of these kinds of habits in a time period when we think of photography as being something like a real photograph of something in the world. Um, but in fact, as Lisa Geidelman has reminded us, uh, raw, the notion of raw data is an oxymoron. Uh, there is no such thing as raw data. And photographs themselves were highly manipulated even at the time. As you can see from this 1890 notebook, 1894 notebook, Crookes was already using aniline dyes for staining his gelatin plates. Now, these are uh, uh, dyes that were discovered in the aniline dye industry, and they were very quickly brought into use, most famously by Wilhelm Vogel, to dye or color different types of silver gelatin plates to make them sensitive to different wavelengths of light. You can see Crookes's method. Even 10 years after photographic plates were being manufactured with dyes in them, people would still dye their own plates. And I think that it's really important to understand how many scientists made their own sensitive plates uh, by using various recipes like this one, where um, he's using cyanine, which was also known as quinoline blue. Um, these were the azelin plates that Fogel speaks of. They're also known or became known as orthochromatic plates. And orthochromatic plates were special plates, very often used in spectroscopy right through, and we'll see them reoccur again in my last example of the orthochromatic plates. Um, Klaus Henschel writes quite a lot about these kinds of scientific or quasi-scientific. As a matter of fact, Klaus Henschel doesn't call them scientific. He calls them pre-scientific, artisanal practice of creating and experimenting with the basic materials of photography. Um, and he doesn't call them scientific. I'd, he calls them artisanal, and perhaps they are. They're really photographic experiments. And it might be that photograph because photographers jumped into this practice with both feet, very often funded by the large aniline dye companies who had a, quite a lot of money and quite a lot at stake in getting aniline dyes into the photographic industry. They look a bit chaotic. People had different methods. They were looking for different things in their aniline dyes. They were looking to do different things with photographic plates. Some were looking for commercial processes. Some were looking for panchromatic plates. And some were just looking to make their plates, as Crooks was doing, extremely sensitive to particular wavelengths of light in this way uh, that people developed their own methods of making plates. And these are often incorporated in the notebooks and not accompanied by the photographs that they, uh, uh, that they then uh, generated. And these photographs were often exchanged. The recipes were exchanged. And it's here that Jennifer Tucker has taught us to see where the community of photographic experimenters sprang up around this validation of photography as a tool. And its reliable, reliability really hinged on the coordination of opinion achieved often by sharing photographs and recreating experiments. I must really keep going. I'm sorry, I got very excited there. Um, and I went on too long because I know I have to get through this in 30 minutes. So I'll just go through another two, um, another two notebook pages of Crookes's and then we'll move on. Here you see another page where um, of, in the Royal Institution notebooks where he's pairing a kind of focus um, for his photograph. Uh, 
Um, and what you what what we have here is a, a sort of incorporation of the photographic material seamlessly in the notebook. And he makes this notebook page that demonstrates curvature on the flat pl plane of a photographic film. And it's in order to make the photographic note match the handwritten notebook. So he's written some notes and then he's stuck the photograph down on it, reversed back to front. Uh, and then he numbered that back in ink um, so that you can see it. And I'm gonna show you a, um, an enlarged version of the bottom piece of that. So you can see actually, by looking in the bottom left-hand corner of the photographic piece, where it says number one backwards and upside down, that he's had to flip the photographic uh, piece over. In fact, that row of numbers on the left-hand side is also upside down and backwards. In order to make it useful so that he can talk about the focus at 82, 83, 84, the, those focal points given, and then attach it to the curvature of the plane in a graphical representation. So you have a flat photographic plane and a graphical representation of the curve. Uh, Crookes does this sometimes in his notebooks. And then you have other places. I mean, too often I think photographs are photographic historians, and I count myself uh, as one of these at fault, have a bad habit of thinking that the whole experiment has to be about the photograph. In this case, Crookes really um, puts the kibosh on that by saying, look, the photograph is there only to see what the U what UV lines are present. It's not to do anything else. In that way, again, he uses very specific material. So here it is, here's a, a spectra. It's been tipped in, as curators might call it. It's more like taped in, uh, which is what uh, scientists tend to do with their photographs. The spectrum here, we should remember, has a negative somewhere maybe in those negative albums. But it's also printed in a very curious way. So it's platinum printed. And I'm sorry, sorry that may or may not be clear on the uh, image that I've given you. Platinum printing, as all good platinum printers will boast about, was a very specialized tool for getting the most grayscale out of a particular image. Platinum has several more steps in the grayscale than silver. So um, Crooks is using it here to get the most out of the differentiation of his uh, spectrum. It's also highly durable and, and a catalyst. You can see on the left-hand side where it started to make the uh, paper deteriorate on the, uh, on the facing side of the notebook. The page shows us to how many photographs Crooks might have made. So part of the problem of reconstructing the expanded notebook is we don't really know what we're looking for and we don't know how big it is. Um, on this page, and you can see, if you can see my cursor, you can see here under the one and two above the uh, photograph, and here again, two more images, and here again, two more images. So this, rep this page actually represents say six photographs in total. At a rough estimate, if I calculate the number of experiments using photography in this notebook alone, and we're on page 136 of about 200 pages in the notebook, even if only half the pages tell us about photographic materials, that's about 500 page photographs produced just in this album alone, this, this notebook alone. And I wanna argue that it's a clear picture of a coordinated set of experiments that were patterned continuously by photographic activity. Um, with Crookes, it's a completely incomplete analysis because we only have half the notebooks and I don't know what's in the other half and come back to me in eight years and we'll find out what's uh, happening in the next um, installment. Not all notebooks, however, were confined to having their photographs housed elsewhere. There are some very specific notebooks that were manufactured um, physically to around the presence of photography. Um, these, this is just a very quick uh, tour through the Piazzi Smythe cloud albums. Um, and we know that Charles and Jesse Piazzi Smythe were both very active photographers. 
meteorology was in itself a group activity very often done by many people and uh, I know that these are normally billed to Charles only but we also know that Jesse Piazza Smythe was a very accomplished photographer and there's no telling who made all of these images. In the 1890s over 400 photographs were made uh, and they constitute four depending on how you count them, five albums. One through three are at the Royal Society in London and four and five are at the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford. And they have pages that are, were printed by a print stationers, by printers, specifically with a blank space to make standard square photographs of clouds. And this is just a representative image from the 29th of April, 1893 in an album that contains images from 1892, 1893, and 1894. And you can see that the form makes it into a scientific exercise in meteorology. However, it also tames images that aren't necessarily meteorolog meteorological. Some of them are, for instance, landscapes uh, that are made to fit into this set of observations about weather and it's interesting um, that they make even very domestic spaces into scientific spaces. In this case, if you look under the uh, C on the right-hand side, it says from station, library, anteroom window. Um, it's a lot like me giving a lecture to you in this uh, conference room that is actually in my library window. Uh, I could say even looking in Leicester, looking Northwest over the garden wall, perhaps. Uh, and at the end of these albums were spaces for the reduction of these uh, photographs. And it's very often that photographs are reduced to data at some point in a scientific notebook. Very often that's the point at which they're most at risk and get thrown away because data is taken off of them and then they are considered to be superfluous. These working images, then often the only record we have of them are in uh, notations somewhat like this one. Let's move on to the photograph, uh, the notebook and the photographic catalog, because we're um, sort of halfway in and I don't want to make you uh, wait too long. So I want to talk about Herman Fairchild. Herman Leroy Fairchild was a geologist and a photographer. He was a professor of geology and natural history at the University of Rochester and one of the founders of the Geological Society of America. And he was a hugely prolific author. 246 publications are in his archive. Um, and at various times he worked for the uh, education department for the state of New York. He worked for Ward Scientific, which was one of the largest scientific uh, instrument and object suppliers. And he did other freelance work. He also sold many of his own photographs, the negatives and the prints, and he bought photographs by others. There's this whole market for science photography that I would love to talk about, but we don't have time to do it here. But we can return to that. I just want to concentrate on two aspects of this expanded notebooks that uh, Fairchild created. He has his own photographs and they are numbered carefully as you see by this Erie Canal image of a cutting south of Lyle Avenue in Rochester, New York, number 881. But he also collected a huge number of photographs. And for this talk, I've taken as an example, a small collection of the Badlands photographs. This one happens to be taken by a photographer with the, and I haven't made this up, name Ulysses Cornell of the, what's called the Big Badlands, uh, the S Badlands in South Dakota uh, in 1894. And I'll get to talking about that in a minute. As tempting as it is to go straight to the Badlands, I think we'll go first to Rochester, which is a bit more tame, but looks perhaps remarkably like the Badlands. In Fairchild's notebooks, he has a combination of uh, field notes and photographs. And the field notes and photographs are linked together through a numbering series, very much like Crookes's numbering series, and a series of dates. So here you see, and I'm going to choose a small group of photographs that Fairchild took uh, that were taken um, uh, that were taken of what he called the pinnacle range. Now range sounds a bit like mountains, but in fact, these are just some tall hills that run 
all along the center of the city of Rochester from what's Cobbs Hill Park right in the middle of it to uh, right near the University of Rochester actually just at Mount Hope Cemetery. And it runs through uh, what is now a large park, but it used to be a series of quarries because it sits on uh, glacial soil, which is sand and gravel and very um, desirable. He chronicles this over a number of years and from a number of views. And he correlates those images by tucking together his own images and making a series that not only covers the whole of the range that he can get to, but also the range as it is developed and industrialized over a number of years. And you can see in this notebook page, also from October 15th, 1904, East End of the Pinnacle Range, and he lists very often his photographs taken. Now this is quite a photographic practice to carry along a notebook and write down the pictures that you just made um, with sheet film or sheet plates as, as uh, Fairchild was using. Of course, there's nowhere to note anything on them until after you develop the plates. The way of creating a kind of notation for yourself is either to make a list of those plates uh, and very often these notations on the left-hand notebook made it into notations on the uh, captions of these photographs. Um, and so Fairchild brings into this practice a kind of notation of geology. He talks about what the soil looked like, how high it was sometimes, different elevations, um, different colors of, of the soil. And then he remarks and puts in numbers um, so that the numbers will fit his notebooks and he can find them again. So here you have one of the photographs. I, these photographs of the Pinnacle Range are from about 1890 to about 1906, or those are the ones that I've found so far. And here are some of the Cobbs Hill Quarry. And here again, you see the notation. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, the sort of sequencing. It looks like the notations are very often and measurements are very often made after or on different days from the photography expedition. So here you see on the right hand side, a photograph made on April 18th, 1895. And on the left, you see on May 16th, more notations of the pinnacle range giving heights, height measures. Um, here, you, both of them are standing on Clink Hill, um, uh, which is just such a wonderful name that I thought should be included. Um, this is the first I've ever heard of Clink Hill, even though I come from near Rochester. Um, here you can see in 1894, yet another series of photographs that he made of the Cane Moraine that is, lies under this uh, pinnacle uh, range, as he calls it. This is going towards the middle of the range. South Goodman Street is about halfway down and getting towards the end of it just before it ends at the, near the university and the river. He wasn't just interested in long views though. He also took these kinds of close-up views showing the kind of rock morphology that he was looking for. And those tend to match these notations about what sort of rock morphology it is. Um, and they made their way into his publications eventually. But what Fairchild also did, he formed an extensive collection of photographs by others, complete with notes often made on the photographs themselves. And this is a sort of argument about the extended, expanded notebook as a plea to extend the analysis of note taking to making a collection of scientific, science photographs. Um, Jennifer Tucker showed how effective these amassed photographs can be even when they're made in disparate circumstances for tourism in studios and elsewhere. And they still can be made or taken as evidence of certain observations in her work on the Tichborne claimant. So I'm going to take that same argument and show that he in actual fact was collecting uh, similar types of photographs uh, of the American West in order to understand and compare them to upstate New York uh, um, glacial ge geology. And he did, I, I've pulled out a particular group of them. Uh, these are photographs by Ulysses Cornell and E.H. Barber of photographs that were made in what was called the Morrill Geological Expeditions paid for by a private donor. They, they originated out of the University of Nebraska, uh, but they did also go to South Dakota and all over the mid Midwest. 
here are photographs by Cornell um, of the Big Bad Lands, as they were called, and also photographs here by E.H. Barber. Um, and you can see that they, although they are also photographs that cl show clear geological morphology, and that's how they're noted, they could also be repurposed from several other things, pictorialist photographs, great photographs of the American West. Um, they really are somewhat indistinguishable from Carlton Watkins, William Henry Jackson, and those. I especially like this notation where these were the bad, bad lands. This is the little bad lands in Nebraska, as opposed to the good bad lands, the big bad lands in South Dakota. And um, just so that you can see it a little bit closer, the kinds of notation um, that, uh, that Fairchild demanded from these was a kind of geological notation not a notation of the expansion of the American West, not a notation used for the railway companies, um, but specifically geology, but they look amazingly similar and could easily be repurposed for them. Here's the back of that particular one, Toadstool Park. I, I really want to go and see this now. So that ends my discussion about where the expanded notebook might be found um, in collections, in uh, personal uh, catalogs. But what do we do once we have those notebooks? What do we, what does it mean when photographs are incorporated in notebooks? If I want to consider all of these photographs as part of the notebook, I want to argue that they're not just illustrative, but that they're an integral part of experimentation. And for that, I'm gonna skip forward to the 1930s to um, Arthur von Hippel and Fred Merrill's Lichtenberg figures. And this is a very short sort of um, foray into where I think this is going next uh, for speculative reasons. You're maybe really familiar with these Lichtenberg figures which are made by discharging electricity on a photographic plate. Um, Beaumont Newhall made them rather famous by putting them in his original history of photography and they were mostly made in the auspices, although they made them in the, in the 1930s, they became part of what became known as the Laboratory for Insulation Research in the 1940s. This is the, uh, one of von Hippel's, Arthur von Hippel's images. I want to turn actually to Fred Merrill's uh, notebooks because Fred Merrill was Hippel, von Hippel's doctoral student. And in the MIT Special Collections, they have his notebooks. And the notebooks, look like common notebooks, but they are also uh, filled with little envelopes of, uh, and the envelopes have um, photographs in them. Here you see Lichtenberg figures taken and the date, 1938. Uh, this is probably Fred Merrill's last notebook. I think at 38, he came back, returned to England, and I don't know much about him once he did. These give discharge capacities, they give the resistance. Now they were making these um, these discharges, unlike former pictures of the same sort, these were made inside of a pressure chamber that, where they were uh, measuring the discharge under pressure in, in different gases. And as you can see, that envelope is filled with a number of photographs and a number of negatives on film sheets and a positive of one of the negatives, number two. And What's interesting about this page that I've brought to you and many of the other pages in this notebook is that they're, they use the photographs clearly as a halfway point for marking the success uh, or failure of particular experiments. And also they measure them for the amount of distribution of the electric charge under particular types of uh, pressure in particular gases. It's interesting that they mark out the ones that need fixing. The one that's printed is the clearest one, number two, made into a positive. And that's what you very often find. Uh, the ones that were then printed into illustration, we can go into that later, were the ones that were the most perfect. This one happens to have landed right in the middle and is um, uh, uh, very successful. So on the, on the page, it says that the charging resistance wasn't sufficiently high. And he marks out three, number three, four, and five um, images that had secondary figures uh, and they were too sharp 
um, resulting in too high of an electric stress. And those three figures are numbers three, four, and five. And you can see that none of those images were singled out for, um, for publication. I want to just now quickly return to the idea that these are not straightforward uh, raw data. They're using Verichrome safety film. Uh, Von Hippel was using the glass plates and Merrill was using the films made by Kodak in the 1930s and discontinued in the 1950s. These are also an orthochromatic uh, film that, were, that used the aniline dye, a derivative of cyanine, again, quinoline blue, to make them sensitive to particular uh, discharges. That makes the images look different than if you had released them on, say, a panchromatic film, which they had in the 1930s. And it's interesting to think about what kind of images an orthochromatic film gives in relation to um, uh, maybe an isochromatic film or a panchromatic film. And it's interesting to think of these photographs as being part of the revolution of color photography in some way. We can talk about that. I know it came up yesterday and we can definitely talk about that more. So I hope that this short tour uh, through a few notebooks will have convinced you that, first of all, that we should consider the working photographs and their dispersed archives because they are dispersed as a sort of expanded notebook. And that we should see the use of photographs, not as illustrations, but as working practices of experiment and observation. That is, that we should take the material practices seriously. We can talk later about what happens when these photographs get plucked from the notebooks and used as illustrations in finished and published work. Um, and the relationship between these working images and those published images. But I'm well over time and I'm going to leave it at that now and just say thank you. <laughs>